How did Napoleon Bonaparte use the French Revolution to become the world-famous emperor we all know today? And how did he bring down an era of royal dynasty lasting over 1000 years? In this video, you will uncover not only why the French Revolution was the perfect opportunity that created just the right circumstances for Napoleon to ascend as French first emperor, but there's more. I'll also tell you why he was exiled twice during his reign, discuss some of his countless battles, the discovery of the amazing author back all the Rosetta Stone, why it's believed Napoleon damaged the Sphinx in Egypt, and what we can learn from Napoleon's incredible story. Now before I tell you how the French Revolution helped shape Napoleon, we have to go back in time to see how he actually got there in the first place. Napoleon Bonaparte was born in Kariska in 1769. The state sold sovereign rights a year before his birth and the island was conquered by France during the year of his birth. His parents were nobles but not wealthy, which meant young Napoleon had to make his own way. The dominant figure in his life was actually his mother. Later in life, Napoleon said, the future destiny of the child is always the work of the mother. His parents recognized his intellect. They sent him to a military school in the mainland France at just nine years old. Nine years old in military school? Dude, I could barely tie my shoes at that age. Now fast forward to 1785, Napoleon graduates and joins the French army. He was made second lieutenant of the artillery in the regiment of La Ferre kind of training school for young artillery officers. Now he's not exactly welcomed, his accent and outsider status made him an easy target for mockery. But Napoleon has a bigger game in mind. He reads, learns and waits for his chance to shine. And that chance comes at the siege of Toulon in 1793. The French army is struggling to take the port city back from the British and the royalist French forces. Napoleon, then a 24-year-old captain, takes control of the artillery. He adopted a plan to capture a hill where Republican guns could dominate the city's harbor and force the British to evacuate. The city falls, and Napoleon is hailed a hero, earning him a promotion to general. So what made Napoleon different from every other ambitious young officer? The answer lies in his relentless pursuit to succeed, an unwavering self-belief. He was never the guy to just fit in or follow the crowd. Now what makes a man want to fight in the distant sands of Egypt and are the rumors surrounding his involvement with the damaged Sphinx true? By the end of 1797, the French Republic was dominant in Western Europe, having defeated almost all its enemies in the War of the First Coalition. In 1798, France was still at war with Britain, and Egypt seemed like a strategic point to undermine Britain's access to its trade interests in India. Napoleon, always the ambitious thinker, also saw it as an opportunity to spread the ideas of the French Revolution to the East. The expedition was a mixed bag of events. While the British Navy completely destroyed the French fleet at the Battle of the Nile, it led to the discovery of the Rosetta Stone. It's said to be the key to deciphering ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. Right now, it's actually a display in the British Museum and not in a French one. Then there's the Sphinx. It's often said that Napoleon's troops used the Sphinx for target practice, damaging its nose. However, his army of painters and engravers produced fascinating images, and in all of them, the Sphinx had already lost her nose. Although a compelling story, it's more a myth than a fact. So how come Napoleon left Egypt shortly after, even with all these amazing discoveries? Well, after a series of devastating military setbacks and with the British Navy cutting off his escape routes, Napoleon realized that Egypt was a lost cause. But as you might have noticed with Napoleon, he is not exactly the one to give up. He cut wind of political turmoil back in France. The French Revolution was at its peak, so he made the cold and difficult choice to abandon his army to return to France in 1799, sailing under the cover of the night to evade British ships. He actually once said, nothing is more difficult and therefore more precious than to be able to decide, and this decision would change everything. His army was left behind in Egypt and was eventually destroyed destroyed and defeated.
Before we dive into Napoleon's role in the French Revolution, do you know why it was actually happening? If you know why the French Revolution was happening, you can skip this part. Otherwise, here's a quick explanation. The French Revolution started in 1789 and had a mix of causes. France was deep in debt because of expensive wars and a tax system that didn't work well. Poor people paid the most, while the rich paid very little. The result was a crisis Louis XVI proved unable to resolve. At the same time, new ideas about freedom and fairness were spreading. People began to question why a king should rule just because he was born into it. These ideas were gaining traction just as food shortage made everything worse. Fed up, people took to the streets. The French people hated King Louis more than I hate getting a scene receipt with no reply. They overthrew the king. Louis XVI, known as the last, was eventually executed. And just like that, the French monarchy's thousand year reign was history, literally. But that was just the start. The revolution went through different phases, including the reign of terror, which was a period of the French Revolution when, following the creation of the First Republic, a series of massacres and numerous public execution took place in response to the revolutionary fever. Upon his return to France in 1799, Napoleon knows he must act swiftly, leaving a failed Egyptian campaign behind. The French Revolution had created a power vacuum, and Napoleon saw this as his golden ticket to the top. Despite the failures in Egypt, Bonaparte returned to a hero's welcome. First thing on his agenda, forging alliances with powerful figures, with Emmanuel Joseph and Pierre Roger, two members of the so-called The Directory, the government in power during the late stages of the French Revolution. They quickly come to a mutual understanding. The Directory has to go. But how to do it without plunging the nation into further bloodshed? It all happened during the coup of 18 Brumaire, a scheme executed on November 9th, 1799. The stakes are sky high. If they pull this off, they flip the entire French government. They effectively cage the Directory, making it clear that resistance is futile. This bloodless coup d'etat overthrew the Directory, replacing it with the French consulate. And guess who they chose as the head of the newly formed French government? Yup, you guessed it, Napoleon was named the first consul at only 30 years old. But Napoleon's ambitions were far from satisfied. Just five years later, in 1804, he does something even more insane. He proclaims himself Emperor of the French. Let that sink in. Once a nobody, ridiculed for his accent and mocked for his height, is now the Emperor of France. Napoleon's genius isn't just a military strategy. He introduces reforms, builds roads, and creates educational systems. He's not just a conqueror, he's a builder of civilizations, a man whose influence extends beyond the battlefield. His Napoleonic code became the foundation of the civil law in many parts of the world even to this day. The Napoleonic code made the authority of men over their families stronger, deprived women of any individual rights, and reduced the rights of illegitimate children. Having conquered the hearts of the French and transformed the very fabric of the nation and being the emperor of the French, what more could a man desire? Now, Napoleon once claimed victory belongs to the most persevering, but how far was he willing to persevere? Did he actually believe he could conquer the entire world? Well, let's not forget, we're talking about Napoleon. He aimed so high you'd think he was making off for something, like his height, for example. I'm obviously joking, but hear me out. There must be a reason why there's such a thing called the Napoleon complex, right? Anyways, let's dive into the Napoleonic Wars, which are a pivotal moment of Napoleon's conquests. The Napoleonic Wars from 1803 to 1815 were a series of conflicts fought between the First French Empire and the Napoleon. Now, there could easily be made a video just on this topic alone, but I will try to cover the most important aspects of it. The Battle of Austerlitz, also called the Battle of the Three Emperors, on December 2nd, 1805, the first engagement and one of Napoleon's greatest victories. Napoleon's desire here isn't merely territorial, it's political. 
He aims to spread the principles of the French Revolution, liberty, equality and fraternity to the rest of Europe. But to do so, he must first dismantle the coalition of the monarchies allied against him. To Tsar Alexander I of Russia and the Holy Roman Emperor Francis II stand in his way. On December 2, 1805, Napoleon orchestrates what many called his masterpiece. Despite being outnumbered, his strategic brilliance crushes the coalition, firmly solidifying his rule over Central Europe. Here he practices his own maxim, never interrupt your enemy when he is making a mistake. Napoleon lets the coalition make the first move, seizing the moment to counterattack and wins the battle. But could a man like Napoleon, so addicted to the taste of victory, ever find satisfaction in a single triumph? The answer is a resounding no. Fast forward to 1812, Napoleon assembles the Grand Army to force the Emperor Alexander I of Russia into rejoining his unpopular continental system by invading Russia on 24 June 1812 with around 685,000 troops. His economic plan to weaken Britain. But what he underestimates is Russia's will to resist and its capacity to absorb laws. The clash is also known today as the Battle of Leipzig, also called the Battle of Nations. The Russians employ a scorched earth policy, strategically retreating while burning their own cities. Napoleon reaches Moscow, only to find it aflame. The Russian winter sets in, and the Grand Armée, unequipped for the harsh conditions, disintegrates. The campaign is a devastating setback, costing hundreds of thousands of lives, puncturing the aura of invincibility that once surrounded Napoleon. The coalition of nations gathers strength, sensing that the seemingly unstoppable force has finally met its match. Match. The total combat deaths probably ran between 2.5 million and 3.5 million, so Napoleon was possibly responsible for the death of half a percent of all mankind at that time. Now what comes next will absolutely blow your mind. In 1814, facing massive military setbacks and an invasion by the European allies, Napoleon is forced to resign. He was exiled to the island of Elba between Costa Rica and Italy. In France, the Bourbons were restored to power. But here's the twist. They gave him sovereignty over the island and allowed him to retain the title of emperor. Fast forward to 1815, Napoleon pulls off a Houdini, escapes Elba, lands in France and guess what? He's welcomed as a hero. Within days, Louis XVIII runs for the hills and Paris rolls out the red carpet for Napoleon. This incredible turn of events launches the Hundred Days, a period when Napoleon tries to fortify his reclaimed throne. But Europe has other plans, a seven collision forms like a storm cloud on the horizon. There were numerous battles with victories and defeats on both sides. But let's skip ahead to the pivotal class at Waterloo. Is Napoleon versus Duke of Wellington and the Prussian Field Marshal von Blücher. Despite some early advantages, Napoleon's star finally falls from the sky. He is finally defeated, resigns again, but this time his exile isn't exactly a Mediterranean holiday. He is sent to St. Helena, a dot of island in the South Atlantic. No more parades, no more armies, just a man, his memoirs, and a slow fade into history with his death in 1821. Napoleon died of stomach cancer, which was the cause of the death specified in the original autopsy. But that's not the end of Napoleon Bonaparte. He continues to inspire and left behind an incredible legacy forever etched into the history books. Now here's what you can learn from him and how to apply it to your own life. Now Napoleon wasn't born with a silver spoon, but he had something even better, unshakable self-belief. So next time you doubt yourself, remember confidence is your secret weapon. Because as he once said, if you want a thing done well, do it yourself. Switch lanes if you have to. Napoleon didn't start at the top, he climbed there by being flexible. So if your current path isn't working, don't be scared to take a detour and jump out in the unknown. Understand when to throw in the towel, Napoleon's reach exceeded his grasp, a classic case of biting off more than he could chew. Be driven, but don't drive yourself into the ground. Even on the battlefield, Napoleon had a book in his hand. Napoleon was a lifelong learner. Even on the battlefield, Napoleon had a book in his hand. If he could find the time to read between wars, you can find time in your everyday. So keep learning. As he once said, show me a family of readers and I will show you the people who've moved the world. 
Anyways, if you like this video, just click the video on the screen. I promise you it's just as entertaining and insightful as this one. You're still here? You're a real one. If you don't want to miss my next video, 